do, 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 do. Good morning, and welcome to Thursday's edition of Everything Yesterday This Morning. I am your host, literally Heather, and I'm so glad to have you joining me today. Um, I have, I think, maybe another long episode, so I'm going to try to go quickly so I'm not so long again. Okay. More than 107,600 Americans died from drug overdoses last year, the highest annual death toll on record. Overdose deaths deaths increased 15% in 2021, up from an estimated 93,655 fatalities the year prior. While the total number of deaths reached record highs, the increase appeared to slow compared to the change seen between 2019 and 2020. When overdose death overdose deaths, I don't know why it's so, so hard for me to say, rose 30%. Even if the increase is smaller than the year before, it's still a record number of deaths. The data helps illustrate one of the consequences of the pandemic which has seen an uptick in substance abuse amid widespread unemployment and mental health issues. According to the report, fentanyl, which is a powerful synthetic opioid, was involved in the most overdose deaths at 71,238. Methamphetamine was implicated in 32,856 overdose deaths, Cocaine in 24,538 and prescription pain medications in 13,503 deaths. The biggest percentage increase in overdose, overdose deaths in 2021 was in Alaska, where deaths were up 75.3% compared to the previous year. To combat the overdose deaths, the United States should invest in harm reduction and treatment programs for people with substance abuse disorders. According to the article, the problem of overdose deaths affects some groups more than others, Native Americans the most, while the overdose death rate for Black people has now overtaken whites. I will say that paying close attention to the state of Washington might be part of the solution. I don't know where they ranked in overdose deaths, But for a state where every single drug is decriminalized, one would think that they would be the number one, and they are not. The war on drugs is lost, and we need to focus on the war on mental health instead. If we took every dollar saved by not incarcerating people for nonviolent drug offenses and instead allocated those resources to mental health programs and rehabilitation programs, We fix the root of the problem instead of raking the leaves that have already fallen. The Biden administration has canceled one of the most high-profile oil and gas lease opportunities pending before the Interior Department. The decision, which halts the potential to drill for oil in over 1 million acres in the Cook Inlet in Alaska, comes at a challenging political moment. When gas prices are hitting painful new highs, The Department of Interior cited a, quote, lack of industry interest in leasing in the area, which I find really fucking hard to believe, for their decision to not move forward with the Cook Inlet lease sale. The department also halted two leases under construction for the Gulf of Mexico region because of, quote, conflicting court rulings that impacted work on these proposed lease sales. Until now, the White House had remained silent about the massive Alaska lease. However, canceling the sale would be keeping in, in keeping with political promises Biden made in the name of halting global warming. Those promises, though, have become a political challenge in the face of prices at the pump. That is what is fucking pathetic about politics. You don't know what is best for the country. Or, I'm sorry. <laughs> Freudian slip there. You don't do what is best for the country. You do what is optically impactful for you. One environmental advocate said they don't want to get hit by the Republicans in light of the high gas prices. They're getting killed on attacks based on inflation. The most visible sign of inflation is high gas prices. Frank and I'm going to butcher this name, 
Girola called the cancellation of the inlet lease, quote, another example of the administration's lack of commitment to oil and gas development in the United States. The president has spoken about the need for additional supplies in the market, but his administration has failed to take action to match that rhetoric because politically, it would not play well. The average price of a regular um, gallon of gas hit an all-time high of $4.40 per gallon. Drew Caputo, who is the VP of Litigation for Lands, Wildlife, and Oceans for the environmental advocacy group Earth Justice, which you have heard me discuss multiple times on my show, said it's good for the climate, which can't handle new oil and gas development, but of course it can handle lithium mines. It's good for Cook Inlet because offshore drilling is dangerous and disruptive. And it's good for the people of Cook Inlet, including Native people who cherish the inlet in its natural state. So it's a really good thing. 69% of the country disapproves of Joe Biden's handling of inflation. I don't know why that was relevant. I had to throw that in there. It was in the article. Okay. The U.S. government has reportedly opened an investigation into Elon Musk's business dealings surrounding his recent $44 billion purchase of Twitter. The SEC is probing Mr. Musk's tardy submission of a public form that investors must file when they buy more than 5% of a company's shares. The disclosure functions as an early sign to shareholders and companies that a significant investor could seek to control or influence a company. The report said that Musk's April 4th disclosure filing was at least 10 days late, a move that is believed to have saved him more than $140 million because share prices could, could, have been higher if the public knew about his ownership of the 5% of the company. It's not clear if the SEC is going to go after Musk, but the report noted that a lawsuit against Musk from the SEC would likely not stop him from taking over Twitter, since the company's board of directors unanimously approved to be acquired by Musk and the SEC may lack the power to do so. Musk's purchase of Twitter is also being reviewed by the FTC. Do you ever notice that the government really likes to poke their finger in the pie of any private citizen that threatens their power? Oh, you mean we can't make a call and demand that the algorithm be corrected to hide stories or voices? We can't have that. Let's make his life a living hell. Um, Musk should just tell them he was late because of the pandemic. Coronavirus prevented him from getting his paper submitted in time. It's worked for everyone else. Uh, Okay, this next one hits a little bit close to home for me, guys. Attorney General Merrick Garland is in hot water for lying during congressional testimony regarding the DOJ's use of of counterterrorism statutes to target parents at school board meetings. I say that in quotations because no one will do fuck all nothing about it other than writing strongly worded letters, finger wag on news channels, and go back to their happy little bubbles where they pretend to care. The House Judiciary sent a letter to Garland yesterday that says they have evidence that he lied in his testimony and that the FBI has labeled at least dozens of investigations into parents with a threat tag created by the FBI's counterterrorism division to assess and track investigations related to school boards. These cases include investigations into parents upset about mask mandates and state elected officials who publicly voiced opposition to vaccine mandates. These investigations into concerned parents are the direct result of and would not have occurred if not for Garland's directive to federal law enforcement to target those categories of people. On October 4th of 2021, in response to a request from the National School Board Association that the federal government use counterterrorism tools, including the Patriot Act, to target parents at school board meetings, Merrick Garland issued a memorandum directing the FBI to address these threats. The press release accompanying Garland's memorandum highlighted the FBI's National Threat Operations Center to serve as a snitch line for tips about parents at school board meetings. 
By October 20th, the FBI had operationalized Garland's um, directive in an FBI FBI wide manual. I cannot talk today. In an FBI wide email, the FBI's Counterterrorism Division and Criminal Division announced the creation of a new threat tag, EDU officials, and directed all FBI personnel to apply it to school board related threats. The Judiciary Committee was informed by whistleblowers that the FBI has opened investigations with the EDU officials threat tag in almost every region of the country, and relating to all types of educational settings. The information they received shows, as a direct result of Garland's directive, federal law enforcement is using counterterrorism resources to investigate protected First Amendment activity. The statement released by the judiciary last night shows three examples. One, an investigation into a mother who told a local school board, we're coming for you. She was then interviewed by the FBI based off a complaint that came through the snitch line because it alleged that the mother was a threat because she belonged to a right-wing moms group known as Moms for Liberty and because she's a gun owner. Maybe this is about me. (laughs) When the FBI interviewed her, she told the agent that she was upset about the school board's mask mandates and that her statement was a warning that her organization would seek to replace the school board with new members through the electoral process. The next parent, who had a counterterrorism investigation opened up, was a dad who opposed mask mandates. The complaint, again, came over the snitch line and alleged that the dad, quote, fit the profile of an insurrectionist because he rails against the government, believes all conspiracy theories, and has a lot of guns and threatens to use them. When the FBI interviewed the complainant, not the person the complaint was about, but the person who called the snitch line, they admitted they had no specific information or observations of any crimes or threats, but they contacted the FBI after learning they had a website where you could submit tips about concerning behavior directed toward the school board. The third case cited in the letter, the FBI opened an investigation into Republican state elected officials over allegations from a state Democratic Party official that Republicans, quote, incited violence by expressing public displeasure with school districts' vaccine mandates. This complaint also came in through the FBI snitch line. Why is this important? The DOJ has subjected moms and dads to the opening of FBI investigations, including the establishment of an FBI case file, that includes their political views, and the application of a threat tag to their names as a direct result of exercising their their right to speak. The FBI agents determined that these cases did not implicate federal criminal statutes, but as Jim Jordan and Mike Johnson stated in the letter, parents have an undisputed right to the upbringing of their children. They cited uh, Troxel versus Granville court case which includes voicing their strong opposition to things like controversial curricula at local schools. Apparently, Merrick Garland has refused to rescind his October 4th memorandum. Honestly, at this point, none of this is surprising, but I mean, I think that people have a right to know if they've been, they have a file opened up on them for exercising their First Amendment rights. See a lot of FOIA requests in the near future. Global stocks of refined petroleum products have fallen to critically low levels as refineries prove unable to keep up with the surging demand, especially for the diesel-like fuels used in manufacturing and freight transportation. The result has been a surge in prices refiners receive for selling fuels compared with the prices they pay for buying crude and other feedstocks, boosting their profitability significantly. In the United States, refiners currently receive roughly an average of more than $150 per barrel 
from the sale of gasoline and diesel at wholesale prices, while paying only around $100 to purchase crude. The indicative 3 to 1 margin of $50 per barrel is based on the assumption a refinery produces two barrels of gasoline, one barrel of diesel from refining three barrels of crude. The margin is meant to be representative for an average refinery and is a gross figure out of what refiners have to pay for labor, electricity, gas, hydrogen, catalysts, pipeline transport, and the cost of capital. There is scope for refiners to increase fuel production by postponing non-essential maintenance and running refineries flat out into the nearly fall or autumn time frame, some room to adjust the output of mix between switching from maximum gasoline to maximum diesel mode in downstream processing units. But any increase in diesel production is unlikely to be able to reverse the depletion of inventories fully and return them to pre-pandemic levels. Prices will therefore have to continue rising until they begin to restrain consumption or the economy enters a cyclical downturn. Could be why you're starting to see people float the idea that the pandemic is not over. Consumers can reduce fuel use in the short term by consolidating freight loads, meaning fewer voyages, flights, and deliveries, reducing speeds, and eliminating engine idling, but the fuel savings are relatively modest and tend to degrade service levels, reduce capacity, and increase capital costs. Love's gas station put drivers on notice with a message that says, due to historically low supply, diesel availability in the eastern United States market is currently limited. Your drivers could start to see the effects of these supply issues in the coming days. We expect to have locations experiencing temporary, intermittent diesel outages. We expect the below states to be impacted by these supply shortages. Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and the message cuts off there from the image that I saw. I'm going to coin this the incoming summer of hurt. I hope you are all prepared. I love you guys. You take care. Have a great Thursday and I will see you tomorrow.